introducing NLP uh, international bestseller Joseph O'Connor and John Seymour introducing NLP psychological skills for understanding and influencing people learning unlearning and relearning although we can consciously take in only a very small amount of the information the world offers us we notice and respond to much more without being aware our conscious mind is very limited and seems able to keep track of uh, a maximum uh, of uh, seven variables or pieces of information at one time this idea was outlined in uh, 1956 by the American psychologist George Miller in a classic paper called the magic number seven plus or minus two these pieces of information do not have a fixed size they can be anything from driving a car to looking in the rear view mirror one way we learn is by consciously mastering small pieces of uh, behavior and combining them into larger and larger chunks so they become uh, habitual and unconscious we form habits so we are free to notice other things so our consciousness is limited to seven plus or minus two pieces of information either from the internal world of our thoughts or from the external world our unconscious by contrast is all the life-giving processes of our body all that we have learned our past experiences and uh, all that we might notice but do not in the present moment the unconscious is much wiser than the conscious mind the idea of uh, being able to understand an uh, infinitely complex world with a conscious mind that can only be hold about seven pieces of information at once is obviously ludicrous 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 the notion of conscious and unconscious is central to this model of how we learn in NLP something is conscious when uh, it is in present moment awareness as uh, this sentence is right now something is unconscious when it is not in present moment awareness 
the background noises that you can hear were probably unconscious until you read this sentence. The memory of your first sight of snow is uh, almost certainly out of conscious awareness. If you have ever helped a young child learn to ride a bicycle, you will be aware of just how unconscious that skill has become in yourself. And uh, the process of uh, turning your last meal into hair and uh, toenails is likely to remain forever unconscious. We live in a culture which believes that we do most of what we do consciously, yet most of what we do and what we do best, we do unconsciously. The traditional view is uh, that learning a skill divides into four stages. First, there is unconscious incompetence. Unconscious incompetence competence. Not only do you not know how to do something, but you don't know, you don't know. Never having uh, driven a car, for example, you have no idea what it is like. So, you start to learn. You very soon discover your limitations. You have some lessons and consciously attend to all of the instruments, steer, coordinate the clutch and watch the road. It demands all your attention. You are not yet competent, and you keep to the back streets. This is uh, the stage of uh, conscious incompetence, when you grind uh, the gears or steer and give uh, cyclists heart attacks. Although this stage is uncomfortable, in brackets, especially for cyclists, it is the stage when you learn the most. This leads you to the sta stage of conscious competence. You can drive the car, but it takes all your concentration. You have learned the skill, but have not yet mastered it. Lastly, and the goal of uh, the endeavor is unconscious competence. All those little patterns that you learned so painstakingly blend together into one smooth unit of behavior. Then you can listen to the radio, enjoy the scenery and hold a conversation at the same time as driving. Your conscious mind sets the outcome and leaves it to your unconscious mind to carry it out.
freeing your attention for other things. If you practice something for long enough, you will reach this fourth stage and form habits. At this point, the skill has become unconscious. However, the habits may not be the most effective ones for the task. Our filters may have caused us to miss some uh, important information uh, and route to in uh, unconscious competence. Suppose you play a possible game of uh, tennis and wish to improve. The coach would probably watch you play, then start changing such things as your footwork, how you hold the racket and the way you bring the racket through the ear. In other words, he would take what was for you one piece of behavior, hitting a forehand drive, break it down into some of its competence component parts and then rebuild it so you hit a better forehand drive. You would go backward through the learning stages to conscious incompetence and you would be unlearning before relearning. The only reason to do this is to build in new choices, more efficient patterns. The same happens in learning NLP. We already have a communication and learning skills. NLP offers to refine your skills and give, your, give you more choices and more flexibility about using them. The four stages of learning. The first, unconscious incompetence. The second, conscious incompetence. The third, conscious competence, and the fourth, unconscious competence. Unlearning is four, two, two. Relearning is two back to four with more choices. We shall be exploring different models of learning later in the book. The three minute seminar. If NLP were ever to be presented in a three minute seminar, it would go something like this. The presenter would walk on and say, Ladies and gentlemen, to be successful in life you need only remember three things. Firstly, know what you want. Have a clear idea of your outcome in any situation. Secondly, 
Be alert and keep your sense open so that you notice what you are getting. Thirdly, have the flexibility to keep changing what you do until you get what you want. He would then write on the board Outcome Acuity Flexibility and leave end of a seminar first is the skill of knowing your outcome if you do not know where you are going it makes it hard to get there an important part of uh, NLP is training in sensory acuity where to place your attention and uh, how to change and uh, enlarge your filters so that you notice things uh, that you had not noticed previously it is present moment sensory awareness when communicating with others uh, this means notice noticing the small but crucial signals that let you know how they are responding when thinking that is uh, communicating with yourself it means heightened awareness of your internal images sounds and feelings you need the acuity of uh, sensitivity to notice if what you are doing is getting you what you want if what you are doing is not working do something else anything else you need to hear see and feel what is happening and uh, have a choice of uh, responses NLP aims to give people more choice about what they do having only one way of doing things is no choice at all sometimes it will work and sometimes it won't so there will always be situations you cannot cope with two choices will put you in a dilemma having a choice means being able to use a minimum of three approaches in any interaction the person who has uh, the most choices of what to do the greatest flexibility of behavior will be in control of the situation if you always do what you've always done you'll always get what you've always got if what you are doing is not working do something else if you always do what you've always done you'll always get what you always got if what you are doing is not working do something else the more choices the more chance of success the way these skills work together 
is rather like what happens when you hire a rowing boat to explore a stretch of water. You decide where you want to go, your initial outcome. You start rowing and notice your direction, sensory acuity. You compare this with where you want to go and if uh, you are off, if you are, of course, you change direction. You repeat this cycle until you reach your destination. Then you set your next destination. You can change your outcome at any point in the cycle, enjoy the journey and learn something on the way. The course is likely to be a zigzag, very real, really is there, there an absolutely clear straight path to where you want to go. Outcomes. Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depend, depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. In Wonderland, Lewis Carroll. Let us begin at the beginning with outcomes or goals. The more precisely and positively you can define what you want, and the more you uh, program your brain to seek out and notice possibilities, the more likely you are to get what you want. Opportunities exist when they are recognized as opportunities. To live the life you want, you need to know what you want. Being effective in the world means producing the results you choose. The first step is to choose. If you do not, there are plenty of people willing to choose for you. How do you know what you want? You make it up. There are some rules for doing this, so that you have uh, the best chance of success. In uh, NLP language uh, you choose a well-formed outcome, that is an outcome that is well-formed in terms of the follow following criteria. First, it must be stated in the positive. It is easier to move toward what you want than away from what you do not want. However, you cannot move toward something if you do not know what it is. As an example, think for a moment of uh, a kangaroo. Are you thinking of a kangaroo? 
Good. Now stop thinking of a kangaroo while you finish reading this page. Do not let the idea of kangaroo come into your mind for the next minute or so. Are you not thinking of a kangaroo? Now think of what you will be doing tomorrow to get rid of that persistent kangaroo you have to think of something else that is positive. This trick makes the point that the brain can only understand a negative by turning it into a positive. In order to avoid something, you have to know what it is you are avoiding and keep your attention on it. You have to think of it, to know what not to think of, just as you have uh, to keep an object in view to avoid bumping into it. Whatever you resist persists. This is one reason why giving up smoking is so, so difficult. You continually have to think about smoking in order to give it up. Secondly, you must play an active part so the outcome must be reasonably within your control. Outcomes that rely primarily on other people taking action are not well formed. If people do not respond the way you want, you are stuck. Concentrate instead on what you need to do to elicit those responses. So, for example, instead of uh, waiting for someone to make friends, think of what you could do to become friendly with them. Think of your outcome as specifically as possible. What will you see, hear, and uh, feel? Imagine it through and describe it to yourself or write it down in terms of who, what, where, when, and how. The fuller the idea of what you want, the more your brain can rehearse it and notice opportunities to achieve it. In what context do you want it? Are there contexts where you do not want it? How will you know? that you have achieved your outcome. What is uh, the sensory-based evidence that will let you know that you have what you want? What will you see, hear and feel when you have achieved it? Some outcomes are so open-ended that they could take several lifetimes to achieve. You might also like to set a time limit on when you wish to have it. Do you have the resources to initiate and maintain the outcome? What do you need? 
Do you already have it? If not, how are you going to get it? This is an issue that needs to be thoroughly explored. These resources may be internal, in brackets, specific skills or positive states of mind, or external. If you find you need external resources, you may need to set a subsidiary outcome to get them. The outcome needs to be an appropriate size. It could be too big, in which case it needs to be split into several smaller, more easily achievable outcomes. For example, you might set an outcome to be a top tennis player. This is obviously not going to happen by next week, as it is too vague and long term. It needs breaking down into smaller chunks, so ask yourself, what stops me from achieving this? This question will high highlight some obvious problems. For example, you do not have a good tennis racket and you need coaching from a professional player. Then convert these problems into outcomes by asking yourself what do I want instead? I need to buy a good racket and find a coach. A problem is simply an outcome that is uh, the wrong way up. You may have to go through this process several times with a very big outcome before arriving at a reasonably sized and achievable first step. Even the longest journey starts with the first step, in brackets, in the right direction, of course. On the other hand, the outcome may seem too small and trivial to motivate you. For example, I might set out to tidy the workroom, a small and not very exciting task, to bring some energy to this, I need to forge a link with a larger, more important, more motivating outcome. So I ask myself, if I got this outcome, what would it do for me? In this example, it might be a necessary step in order to create a working space for doing something else that is much more interesting. Having made that connection, I can uh, tackle the small outcome with energy drawn from the larger one. The final frame around choosing outcomes is ecology. No one exists in isolation. We are all part of larger systems, family, work, friendship, networks, and society in general. You need to consider the consequences 
of achieving your outcome in the context of these wider relationships. Would there be any undesirable byproducts? What would you have to give up or take on to achieve it? For example, you might want uh, more freelance work. This would take up more time, so you will spend less time with your family. Achieving a big contract might increase your workload to such an extent that you could not do the job adequately. Make sure your outcome is in harmony with you as the whole person. Outcomes are not about getting what you want at the expense of uh, others. The most valuable and satisfying results are achieved by negotiating and cooperating to establish shared outcomes where everyone wins. This automatically takes care of the ecology issue. These sorts of issues may make your revise your outcome or change it to another outcome that serves the same intention without having the undesirable byproducts. The classic example of choosing an uh, unecological outcome was King Midas, who wanted everything he touched to turn to gold. He soon found this was a dis distinct liability. Outcomes Summary you can remember this from the mnemonic pos posers spelled out by the first letter of the key word for each step. Positive. Think of uh, what you want rather than what you do not want. Ask, what would I rather have? What do I really want? The second, own part. Think of what you will uh, actively do that is within your control. Ask, what will I be doing to achieve my outcome? How can I start and maintain it? The third specific. Imagine the outcome as specifically as you can. Ask who, where, when, what and how specifically. Larger outcome, step up. Larger outcome, if I got this outcome, what would, would it do for me? For me. Uh, outcome step down what prevents me smaller outcome the fourth evidence 
think of the sensory-based evidence that will let you know you have got what you want. Ask. What will I see, hear, and feel when I have it? How will I know that I have it? The fifth. Resources. Do you have adequate resources and choices to get your outcome? Ask. What resources do I need to get the outcome? The sixth. Size. Is the outcome the right size? If it is too large, ask. What prevents me from uh, getting this? And turn the problems into other smaller outcomes. Make them uh, sufficiently clear and uh, achievable. If it is too small to be motivating, ask. If I got this outcome, what would it do for me? Move up until you relate it to an outcome that is sufficiently large and motivating. Uh, the seventh, ecology frame. Uh, check uh, the consequences in your life and relationships if you got your outcome. Ask, who else does this effect? What would happen if I got it? If I got it straight away, would I take it? Be sensitive to your feelings of doubt that start, yes, but. What considerations do these feelings of doubt represent? How can you change your outcome to take them into account? Now run this modified outcome through the posers process to check that it is still well formed. The last step is uh, take action. You have to make the first move. The journey of uh, a south thousand miles begins with one step. If the outcome is well formed, it is achievable, motivating, and much more likely to be compelling. and desired state. Okay, let's stop here. And we'll continue the next time.